All right, chapter 15, section 3, The Gilded Age. Main idea, industrialism and urbanization changed America's culture, changed American society's ideas and culture in the late 1800s. Key terms and names, Gilded Age, Social Darwinism, Gospel of Wealth, Philanthropy, Realism, Vaudeville, Ragtime, Scott Joplin. Okay, let's kick it off. An American story. In 1872, at the age of 32, William Graham Sumner became professor of political and social science at Yale College. Sumner's classes were very popular. One of his students, William Lyon Phelps, il illustrated Sumner's tough, no-nonsense approach with his example of a class dis discussion. Student, Professor, don't you believe in any government aid to industries? Sumner, no. It's a it's root, hog, or die. Student, yes, but hasn't the hog got a right to root? Sumner, there are no rights. The world owes nobody a, th a living. Student, you believe then, Professor, in only one system, the contract competitive system? Sumner, that's the only sound economic system. All others are fallacies. Student, well, suppose some professor of political economy came along and took your job away from you. Wouldn't you be sore? Sumner, any other professor is welcome to try. If he gets my job, it's my fault. My business is to teach the subject so well that no one can take the job away from me. Adapted from social Darwinism in American thought. Interesting. Okay. A changing culture. In 1873, Mark Twain and Charles Warner wrote a novel together entitled The Gilded Age. Historians later, later adopted the term and applied it to the era, I'm sorry, the era in American history that begins about 1870 and ends around 1900. <clears throat> This era was in many ways a time of marvels. Amazing new inventions led to rapid industrial growth. City, cities expanded to sizes never seen before. Masses of workers thronged the streets. Skyscrapers reached to the sky and electric lights banished the darkness. Newly wealthy entrepreneurs built spectacular mansions. By calling this era, era the Gilded Age, key term... Twain and Warner were sounding an alarm. Something is gilded if it is covered with gold on the outside, but made of cheaper material on the inside. The Gilded Age might appear to sparkle, but Twain, Warner, and other writers tried to point out that beneath the surface lay corruption, poverty, crime, and great disparities in wealth between the rich and the poor. Whether the era was golden or merely gilded, it was certainly a time of great cultural activity. Industrialism and urbanization altered the way Americans looked at themselves and their society. And these changes brought, uh, gave rise to new values, new art, and new forms of entertainment. The idea of individualism. One of the strongest beliefs in the era is that uh, one that remains strong today is the idea of individualism, key term. Many Americans firmly believe that no matter how humble their origins, they could rise in society and go as far as their talents and commitment would take them. In 1885, the wealthy cotton manufacturer Edward Atkinson gave a speech to a group of workers at a textile factory in Rhode Island. He told them they had no reason to complain, and he said... There's always plenty of room on the front seats in every profession, every trade, every art, every industry. There are men in this audience who will fill some of those seats, but they won't be boosted into them from behind. Horatio Alger No one expressed the idea of individualism better than Horatio Alger. A minister from Massachusetts, Alger eventually left the clergy and moved to New York. There he wrote more than a hundred rags-to-riches novels in which a poor person goes to the big city and becomes successful. 
Many young people loved reading these tales. Inspired by Alger's novels, they concluded no matter how many obstacles they faced, success was possible. Social Darwinism Another powerful idea of the era was social Darwinism, which strongly reinforced the idea of individualism. English philosopher Herbert Spencer, key term, key name, first proposed this idea. Historian John Fisk, political scientist William Graham Sumner, and the magazine Popular Science Monthly all popular, popularized it in the United States. Herbert Spencer Philosopher Herbert Spencer applied Charles Darwin's key term, key name, theory of evolution and natural selection to human society. In his 1859 book on the origin of species by means of natural selection, Darwin argued that plant and animal life had evolved over the years by a process he called natural selection. In this process, those species that cannot adapt to the environment in which they live gradually die out, while those that do adapt thrive and live on. Spencer took this, took this biological theory, intended to explain developments over millions of years, and argued that human society also evolved through competition and natural selection. He argued that society, that society progressed and became better because only the fittest people survived. Spencer and others who shared his views became known as social Darwinists, and their ideas were first known as social Darwinism, key term. Survival of the fittest became the catchphrase of their philosophy. By 1902, over uh, 350,000 copies of Spencer's books had been sold in the United States. Social, Darwin, social Darwinism also paralleled the economic doctrine of laissez-faire that opposed any government programs that interfered with business. Not surprisingly, industrial leaders like John D. Rockefeller heartily embraced the theory. Rockefeller maintained that the survival of the fittest is demonstrated as demonstrated by the growth of huge businesses like his own standard oil was Quote, unquote, merely the working out of the law of nature and the law of God. Darwinism in the Church Rockefeller may have appreciated Spencer's interpretation of evolution, but Charles Darwin's conclusions about the origins of new species frightened and outraged many devout Christians, as well as some leading scientists. They rejected the theory of evolution because they believed it contradicted the Bible's account of creation. Some American scholars and ministers, however, concluded that evolution may have been God's way of creating the world. Henry Ward Beecher of Plymouth Church in Brooklyn called himself a cordial Christian evolutionist. Beecher accepted Spencer's ideas of social Darwinism and championed the success of American business. Hmm... Carnegie's Gospel of Wealth. The wealthy and prominent business leader at the time, Andrew Carnegie, believed wholeheartedly in social Darwinism and laissez faire. Speaking of the law of unregulated competition, he wrote It ensures the survival of the fittest in every department. We accept and welcome, therefore, as conditions to which we must accommodate ourselves, great inequality of the environment the concentration of business in the hands of a few, and the laws of competition as being not only beneficial, but essential for the future progress of the race. Believing that those who profited from society owed it something in return, Carnegie attempted to extend and soften the harsh philosophy of social Darwinism, of social Darwinism with the gospel of wealth. Key term. This philosophy held that wealthy Americans bore the responsibility of engaging in philanthropy, key term, using their great fortunes to further pro social progress. Carnegie himself, for example, donated millions of dollars as the, the quote-unquote trustee and agent for his poor brethren. 
Other industrialists also contributed to social causes. Realism. Just as Darwin had looked at the natural world scientifically, a new movement in art and literature known as realism attempted, key term, realism, attempted to portray people realistically instead of idealizing them as romantic artists had done. Realism and art. Realist painters rejected the idealistic depictions of the world such as of the earlier 1800s. One, paint, one such painter, Thomas Aikens, key term, that's E-A-K-I-N-S, of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, considered no day-to-day -day subject beneath his interest and careful observation. On his canvases, with their realistic detail and precise lighting, young men swarm, surgeons operated, and scientists experimented. Aikens even dared to paint President Hayes working in shirt sleeves instead of a more traditional formal dress. Realism in Literature Writers who also attempted to capture the world as they saw it. In several novels, William Dean Howells, key term, key name, presented realistic descriptions of American life. For example, his 1885 novel, The Rise of Silas Lafram, described the attempts of a self-made business person to enter Boston society. Also an influential literary critic, Howells was the first to claim Mark Twain to be an American genius and hailed him as, quote-unquote, incomparable, the Lincoln of our literature. Twain, a Missouri native whose real name was Samuel Clemens, wrote his masterpiece, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, in 1884. In this novel, the title character and his friend Jim, an escaped slave, float down the Mississippi River on a raft. Through their innocent eyes, readers gain a piercing view of American society in the pre-Civil War era. Twain wrote in his local dialect with a lively sense of humor. Nevertheless, Howells realized that Twain was more than a humorist. He had written a true American novel in which the setting, subject matter, characters, and style were unmistakably American. Howells also recognized talent in the work of a very different writer, Henry James, key, key term, key, word, key name, who lived most of his adult life in England. In novels such as Portrait of a Lady, 1881, James realistically characterized the inner lives of the upper class. Isabel Archer, the lady of the title, reflects one of the prime values of her class, the concern to maintain social position by marrying well. Ultimately, Isabel's wealth interferes with her ability to pursue her own happiness. Edith Wharton, key name, key term, who also concerned herself with the upper class she knew, modeled her realistic writing after those of James. She won a Pulitzer Prize for her novel, the Age of Innocence, a stark portrait of upper-class New York society in the 1870s. Popular culture. Popular culture changed considerably in the late 1800s. Industrialization improved the standard of living for many people, enabling them to spend money on entertainment and recreation. Increasingly, urban Americans, unlike rural people, divided their lives... Out, uh, into separate units, that of work and that of home. Furthermore, people began looking for things to do outside the home and began going out to public entertainment. The Saloon As Frank Lloyd Wright had noted when he arrived in Chicago, the city's saloons far outnumbered its groceries and meat markets. Functioning like, a community, like community centers, saloons played a major role in the life of male workers in the 1800s. They also served as political, as political centers. 
Saloon keepers often served as key figures in political machines. Saloons offered free toilets, water for horses, and free newspapers for customers. They even offered the first quote-unquote free lunch, salty food that made patrons thirsty and eager to drink more. Saloons developed loyal customers. The first workers from the night shift would stream in at 5 a.m., and the last would stay until late at night. Amusement Parks and Sports While saloons catered mostly to men, working-class families or single adults who sought excitement and escape could go to amusement parks such as New York's Coney Island. Amusements there, such as water slides and railroad rides, cost only a nickel or a dime. Watching professionals box or play baseball also became popular during the late 1800s. A game much like baseball, known as rounders, and derived from the game of cricket, had enjoyed limited popularity in Great Britain in the 1800s. version of the modern game of baseball began to appear in the United States as early as in the early 1800s. As the game grew in popularity, it first became a source of it became a source of profit. The first salaried team, the Cincinnati Red Stockings, was formed in 1869. Other cities soon fielded professional teams, and in 1903, the first modern World Series was played between the Boston Red Sox and the Pittsburgh Pirates. The second most popular game, football, appeared first to the upper classes in part because it began in private colleges and universities the middle classes uh, and working classes could not afford. By the late 1800s, the game had spread to public universities. As work became less physically strenuous, many people looked for leisure activities involved physical exercise. Lawn, tennis, golf, and croquet became popular. James Naismith, a Canadian working as a as an athletic director for a college in Springfield, Massachusetts, invented the game of basketball in 1891. Vaudeville and Ragtime The many people living in the cities provided large and eager markets for other types of entertainment. Adapted from French theater, vaudeville took an American flavor in the early 1880s with a hodgepodge of animal acts, acrobats, gymnasts, and dancers. The fast-moving acts, like the tempo of big city life, went on in continuous shows all day and night. Like vaudeville, ragtime music, key term, echoed the hectic pace of city life. Its syncopated rhythms grew out of the music of riverside honky-tonk, saloon pianists, and banjo players using the patterns of African-American music. Scott Joplin, key name, key term, one of the most important African-American ragtime composers, became known as the King of Ragtime. He published his signature piece, The Maple Leaf Rag, in 1899. And that concludes Section 3.